invocation at 7.06. If everyone would rise to do the Pledge of Allegiance. statement to keep us all on track for why we're here what's the real purpose our mission is to inspire in each student a joy and passion for learning and a commitment to excellence personal integrity and social responsibility which is I think the perfect segue into our Avon achievers so I'd like to bring forward Bill Duffy from Thompson Brook and I'm going to have Jace Spivak join you so we can recognize our Avon achievers I would like to call up Leah Kyler and Arissa Lee. So we have Leah Kyler and Arissa Lee, who are two of our sixth graders at Thompson Brook. Why don't you turn around and face the board, unless you prefer the camera? <laughs> I'm new at this. Why don't you turn around and face the camera? Back here. Um, so Leah and Arissa are two of our, our student leaders at Thompson Brook School. They are outstanding role models for all of our students. They are uh, outstanding academically, they're involved socially, and they do so many activities at our school that really make it a positive place for all of us to learn and be. Uh, they are both on our student council. They are the right and left arm of Mrs. Chaves, who is our student council advisor. They have participated in our bus driver appreciation day all of our fundraisers and the spirit days that our student council runs. Uh, just last week we did our first student-led conference or monthly meeting that we have to recognize our students and some of their achievements. And these two became the MCs and not only that, they wrote the script and they planned the entire event uh, for the most part. So they stood up in front of the entire school and were able to present uh, the, the uh, ceremony. Um, so I, I would just like to also add that uh, Arissa has, has really um, lent something to our school in terms of an activity that she does. <coughs> she takes it upon herself to gather three or four or five other students from orchestra, the strings group that she's in. And whenever it's a staff member's birthday, the group will slowly come in. It, it happened in the office a few weeks ago and made Mrs. Esposito's day. The group just gathers quietly, and all of a sudden you hear happy birthday being played on, on the day of the, the staff member's birthday. So she goes all around the school and leads that group and makes it a special day, and really makes it uh, just a positive, that much more of a positive place to be. So I'd like to recognize Leah and Arissa for all of those outstanding things that they do, that you two do, to make Thompson Brook a fantastic school. They're great leaders and role models. levels we have so many leaders in this district and it's just going to continue as they move on up through the high school so it's exciting to see you today but maybe we'll see you again in a few years so next I'd like to invite Dr. Carnamola to acknowledge our Avon Youth Services Advisory Board and Jeff Fleischman <laughs> So for those of you who may not know what the Avon Youth Services Board is, it is a community board that is made up of individuals from the school district, from the community, from the town government side, chief of police, myself, um, that meets at least monthly to make decisions about programming for young people in the town, needs of people in town, um, partnerships between the school district, and the town as a whole, and it is a pretty daunting task. I, I would say you're sitting at a table with often the superintendent of schools, principals from our schools, the chief of police, at times the town manager, uh, parents, parents of alumni, and we have been fortunate enough to have 
a young woman who for eight, eight years, five years, just felt like eight. <laughs> six years. We're just at six. Yeah. Um, for six years, so think of that, this is one of our graduating seniors who has served on that board for a steady six years, um, giving up her time at night, certainly with many other things going on, because she's also an excellent student, to be able to represent all of the young people in Avon and all of the students in our schools. So uh, Ms. Lezinsk was recognized already by the town council, but I did not want to let it go by without also recognizing her here at the Board of Education. watching Sarah grow through the years because she's the same grade as my oldest and so she's such a, a really beautiful young woman that I've seen you become and I'm very impressed with your dedication and it speaks to your character and I know that's going to follow you for the rest of your life so thank really you. hold that this is this is you and we're proud of you so thank, thank you, so you. next I would like to call Mike Reinkwitz for we would like to acknowledge a staff member who has done a lot of inspiring as well. At uh, this time, if I could ask Janine uh, Ross to come forward. For the record, we sprung this on her. <laughs> Janine thought she was just going to be here to talk as the coach, but I get the opportunity to tell her tell everyone else about her coaching and uh, with uh, Mr. Lukowitz who couldn't be here this evening. But Janine has coached the, the A-team uh, math the competition. We'll, get, we'll let her share all those details later. Um, she's also been very involved with uh, Girls Who Code, uh, which is another segment of student recognition tonight. So Janine, on behalf of the Avon school community and the Avon community at large, as well as those other communities for Girls Who Code, thank you very much for And we'll pass it to Janine to recognize our young people that she has worked so diligently with. Thank you, Janine. And I, I actually will, would be sharing this with, with the people I'm recognizing today because they do make my, my life and my uh, job uh, the joy that I, I get out of it. Um, first, we're going to recognize the Avon High School math team. This is our, our, our second year winning our league and states in a row and we came in second place in New England which is the highest that we've come in place in New England um, ever and <laughs> when I say ever this is going back mm -hmm. to at least since the 80s if not before then and I'd like to thank all of you Minghao Wang Christina Hay, Luke Choi, Walden Yan, and Bang Jun Cho. I didn't even ask them to sort themselves. <laughs> but um, uh, we have four of them going uh, to represent the state of Connecticut in the American Regional Math League competition. Um, uh, Sneha, Christina, Luke, and Bumjoy are going to be uh, representing, um, hopefully, at least one of them on the A team, maybe two on the A or two on the B. But they're representing, uh, we sent three teams from the state of Connecticut to the, the American Regional Math League competition. And that is later on the agenda. It's one of the field trips that is being approved. Walden Yan also made the team, but he is uh, going to uh, try out for the national uh, computer science team during the same time that the others are competing for our school in the state of Connecticut. And congratulations to all, and Fun June is our senior captain and has led the team very well. And we're going to miss him a lot next year, but we'll hopefully 
people will keep up the good work too. So thank you. I would be remiss in not mentioning that their their real head coach for the math team is is Ben Lukowitz, and Mr. Lukowitz works with them. Uh, pretty rigorously on, on uh, Tuesdays of every month and one of the reasons I don't work with them as rigorously is because all the material that they're using to study for or practice on for the math meets I created in the past and I also write with a few colleagues the math meets that they're taking so I have to distance myself a little bit. I'm more of their uh, general manager. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the next uh, two that I would like to recognize, um, it says under Avon Girls Who Code, and they are uh, some of the leaders of our Girls Who Code in Avon, and they recently were uh, honored at the state capitol for winning the Congressional App Challenge for the 5th District of the State of Connecticut for the second year in a row, Deepa and Jaya Hari. Well, the first question is always which one's deeper and which one's Jaya. And I've actually been teaching them for at least two years at this point. Um, Deepa and Jaya. I have I have ways that I can tell them apart. I won't tell you because I think you're like this. <laughs> <laughs> but Deepa and Jaya, this is their second year in in a row winning the Congressional App Challenge. Uh, and this year they created an application that is a health wallet where it keeps track of your medications and your appointments and it has some nice uh, graphing features where it's graphing improvements and kind of keeping track of your health. Uh, last year's application was a kind of a, I want to call it a chemistry calculator but they called it more of a forensic kind of calculator where you're checking out, you're entering data in and, and it, <coughs> it, it uh, runs, maps. yeah, it simulates. The, the reaction, whether it's a bubbling water reaction or it's a gas reaction, or if it, it tells you what the reaction is between chemicals. Um, both of these applications, one, um, because of their usefulness and because of the purpose behind it. So I'm looking forward to great things uh, next year from maybe three years in a row. Three peaks always, always good, but they're also going to be of a help to um, their their mother and I were hoping to start a um, uh, bring the girls who code to a, a younger age group and they're some of our, our our leaders with the younger kids as well and a shameless plug we are running a scratch day June 1st <laughs> okay and it's a uh, third through 12th graders and it'll be right here at Avon High School from 1 to 4 o'clock on prom night <laughs> it's before, it's before prom, so you can do before prom. <laughs> so, and oh, another one is they will be soon publishing a book, okay, to help uh, parents and children learn um, black coding culture. And we'll see that through. And maybe that We'll be working on their capstone project. Ms. LaBrosse, you do need to point out which one's which for Mr. Capital. So that would be helpful to me. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs>
myself, last but not least, I'll try not to get choked up. <laughs> yes. I would like to acknowledge Amir Johnson. So incredibly proud of you. I feel like I've gotten to know you over the last four years because you've done so much work with us, even as a freshman, as a sophomore, and then to come and join us on this board. Yeah. You've not simply sat there and there. You have joined our conversations. You've participated in giving us perspective from the students and what you need, and you've been honest, but you've always been respectful, and you've always had a smile on your face. And if you keep those talents, people will continue to listen to you because you have a gift. And so I hope that you will continue to give service as you go on through your education. Is Sacred Heart where you're yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. You're such a gift to us. And so this is just a token to give to you. But please know, we will remember you. So come back and visit, OK? Yeah. I'm a hugger. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that you've shown to being a full-fledged board member is absolutely commendable uh, while juggling many other things that you do in athletics and, and your studies and the sheer fact that you are not getting in the car and going around the corner to go home um, often when you leave us at night stopping running in from wrestling matches and so on I, I just I've been impressed with your presence for sure but also by your insights and your um, ability to participate fully in the discussions that we've had, which is absolutely what I would hope and expect in a student board member. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and talent. This is an excellent way to start our May meeting. It feels crazy to think school is almost out, but we know that majority of you came here tonight to celebrate with us at this time so please don't feel shy about removing yourselves if you would like to enjoy the rest of your evening we would love to keep you but you are more than welcome to head out there's a lot of excitement to come though yeah, yeah. <laughs> but congratulations yes, parents you. of all these thank students you. as well good job well done all right so moving forward can i have a motion to approve the minutes from last month's board meeting Jason moves. I have a second. Second by Jackie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Communication from the public. Yes, I will. I'm Susan Ritano Dayton. I'm the president of ACORN. And ACORN is a community organization that raises money to invest in resources and infrastructure for recreation in town. And our project right now that we've just taken on is to raise funds to light the fields. That it was kind of fun to see that because I, I don't come here anymore, so to see this all dug up. Um, just a very brief history. We came together when we knew the referendum vote, vote was going to be coming forward. We were not privy to any numbers then, so we did some research on our own and found out that the benchmark was going to be to raise about $200,000. Um, we did some focus groups, found out that the appetite for donating for this project is pretty low in town. I think a lot of people are feeling like this is something the town should pay for. So we're going to be very aggressive in our fundraising. Unfortunately, our estimates were way off. 
the low bid for this project for just the lights component is four hundred thousand dollars, three ninety nine nine and change. Um, so we are way outside of what we think is our capacity to fundraise. We were very fortunate that the town, um, Mark Zaki and I are working closely together. He's the chair of the uh, the actual construction committee for the project, and we were able to make a pitch to the town that they invest now in the stanchions, which are the concrete footings into which the light poles will go. This was one of those penny-wise decisions because we were going to now put them in and not have to disturb it later in once the light money had been raised. So that's about a $70,000 donation. Later today in this meeting, you'll be voting on a proposal to make a small donation toward this project with surplus funds. Um, I hope you will all approve that, but what we really are looking for is, is considerably more. We're looking for potentially the Board of Ed to triple that investment um, or at least match what the town is able to contribute to us so that we can get our target down closer to the $200,000 that we planned for and had done some early fundraising planning for. Um, so that's why I'm here. I'm hoping you'll all support it. This is a project that not only supports the kids here, but everybody in the community. So the younger children that are coming through will use these fields for their practices. Uh, we'll be able to host events that we're not able to host now because we're not compliant in certain ways. Um, for the older population, for people like me, whose youngest child has graduated, the fields, the, uh, the uh, track will be lit at a very minimum um, capacity, so it's not disruptive at all. But for people who aren't able to go running on the roads or, or older people who don't, who don't run at all that might want to just walk and get some exercise, so this is something that the whole community can get behind. Um, and lastly, it creates a social magnet because when you have a community coming together under the lights for an event, it does bring things together. Avon doesn't have a town center. There aren't a lot of things that bring us together. So this has the potential to make, to really be transforming for our, for our town. So I hope you all vote for it. And I just can't see Amir without saying, Amir was on our project, um, I mean our um, Go Avon committee, and Go Avon is the orientation program for freshmen. And I had the pleasure of running it for, um, hopefully not this year, but we don't know. We got to no, talk about that. I did it last year. Todd, Todd and some students are off and running. Oh, awesome. Okay, if you great. want to come to a meeting tomorrow night, it's a 5.30 evening. Okay, I, I, I might. Just to, yeah, give, give them some notes. But Amir was fantastic. And it wasn't always easy for you to get here because you know it was a far drive and sometimes a meeting here at night and then early mornings. And, and you were just a bright light on that committee. I was always happy that you were joining us. And um, I hope that, did you say his name is Todd? Yes. Todd is able to find somebody that can fit in your very good shoes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Okay. The student rep report, Addison and Amir. Hi. Um, so I think I'm going to start with a brief um, kind of recollection of the academic activities that have been going on at Avon High School within the past month. So uh, last week was the ending of the two weeks of AP exams. And I know that that being over has taken a lot of stress off of many students, including mine, shoulders. And then today, juniors had the next gen science exams, which are a, I think they're a national exam, but they might just be in Connecticut. So um, there's a lot of academic things going on at the end of the year right now. Thank you. Um, and I can't go without saying thank you to the board and thank you to everyone uh, for this token of appreciation. Uh, it's not something you always expect when you do your, um, you, when you go about doing your job or doing work. You never expect someone to thank you for the things that you've uh, contributed. Um, so I do thank you for um, just a small token of your appreciation. Um, I'm always, always uh, happy and excited when someone kind of recognizes me for things that I don't even think I should get recognized for. Um, and also, <laughs> When I'm standing up there, I'm always nervous because I never know how to stand because I'm always so tall and I'm always like, what can I do with my hands? I don't know. <laughs> um, that's one thing. Um, so in the sports aspect of Avon High School, we recently uh, had senior night for those students in the spring sports and as well as um, we congratulate those students and those teams that have now uh, ended their regular season and start going into the playoff season as they try to compete 
uh, for the state uh, first place title. And that's kind of what goes on in the sports realm here um, during this springtime. Thank you. a drastic decrease in the unencumbered balance, totaling about 4.22% reduction from the month prior. The journal entries that we focus on are in Object Code 200, which are the benefits um, section. We made journal entries between January and April for the employer portion of health insurance, as well as the um, ASO fees, stock loss, and then retiree um, employer contributions as well. So that totaled just over $2 million. Additionally, Object Code 600 had about a 5.86% reduction um, in its unencumbered balance, and that's due to the system being reopened for final year end purchasing, which the schools have clearly commenced, and we'll see that go right through the second week of June. Budget uh, went to referendum, passed, but it passed because of uh, insufficient voter participation. There was only 6.2 percent turnout, 365 votes in favor, 444 against. Um, that's disappointing in terms of uh, the insufficient turnout because it's really not the way we want the process to go, and that's the way they felt over at uh, Board of Finance, and we feel similarly on the Board of Ed. Uh, that no matter how people feel, um, it would be better if they got out there and voted and we had more of a decisive direction from the voters. Uh, and we can deal with either outcome if it comes down to that, but we would like the voters to get more involved. And so hopefully next year we'll have enough of a turnout that the decision made by the voters will be an actual decision affirmatively by them. Uh, so that's one of the key issues that, that we had. But the good news is, that our budget is funded. We're, we're all set for next year. Uh, so that, that part is good. Uh, then there is um, a couple of things bouncing around at the state level that are potentially troublesome, such as the proposed uh, contribution to teachers' uh, pensions, uh, which is a problem for a number of reasons. Uh, we won't know for sure how that's going to pan out until the state settles up its budget for the upcoming year. Uh, and in fact, 
almost everything that's been talked about, whether it's regionalization or if it's um, uh, pensions or anything else, it's really all in play right up until that budget is finally approved. That there's really nothing that they couldn't squeeze in at the last minute if they were so motivated. The process is not really as transparent as I wished it was. Uh, but that's not so much the town's problem in that we don't have control over that process. We simply have to adapt to it and uh, we'll uh, follow from there. That's all I have. Thank you, David. Uh, board reps of the Avon Town Council, Jason, and would you mind also giving us a report on how to turn the project to Sure, I can do both. Uh, town Council of Matt on May 2nd. Uh, there were several high school students there who spoke during the public comment about uh, global warming and climate change. They asked the town council to pass a resolution to support uh, renewable energy measures. They gave the council a draft resolution that they said they would consider and discuss further. So they gave some. It was an impressive presentation by that group. That's about the impressive. By the council, as the superintendent said, uh, also recognized Sarah. Uh, Um, the council approved the contract for the high school fire alarm system, so that was cited the board of the town council meeting for the uh, contract was going to work. Um, doesn't have a ton to do with us, but I thought it was nice to see that the town council voted to uh, have another fall carnival this year, like we did last year in uh, September. And uh, otherwise, the next meeting is June 6th for the town council. I'm not available at the time of the green concert. Moving on to the turf field, our meeting was on May 8th. It was a quick meeting. The project is kind of in its infancy, obviously, but it's on schedule. Uh, the subcontractor was picked for the turf carpet. He said, I'm going to the field. So we that work. Um, there was some discussion at the meeting about the um, Avon High School shrubbery out by the field. It uh, apparently was an Eagle Scout project in the past. Those shrubs were moved over and okay, the work was done. And they moved over to uh, looks like center field. Other than that, the next meeting is on June 5th. Hopefully, things will stay on course. Thank you very much. Board Rep to the Capital Region Education Council, Jackie. Uh, I did not attend this month, but I can get the minutes as soon as they are available and forward them to the office. Thank you. Chair's report. Um, I think I'd just like to remind everyone that we do have graduation coming up on June 17th. I'm hoping that we will have full participation from board members. Um, it's an exciting time. It'll be a new location. Do you have a recommendation, Dr. Carmel, as to what time we should arrive? It starts at 5.30. What time would you like us there? Uh, Kelly will continue to that, but I believe being there by quarter five, not five o'clock at the latest. Yeah, 4.30. Yeah. So. Guide we'll us sure, through yes. how we get up there and all of that. It's new for all of us yes. this year, but yes. All right, excellent. Um, lots of exciting awards and nights coming up um, at the schools and all these concerts that we're attending. Um, so it's an exciting time of year, but it's all a whirlwind as well. So hopefully, if board members can attend anything, if you're curious about certain dates, Shirley does a good job of putting it on the calendar, but I try to put them on mine as well. So just reach out and I will supply you with that information if you'd like to join. Um, I think that's it for me. So now, Dr. Carmoli, your report. So, uh, so we have we have some retirements. Um, we actually were at the reception to celebrate the retirements of Josie Bella and uh, Mark Leonard Kovic from the middle school tonight. Uh, both moving on to the next chapter, so to speak, with their lives had a, a very nice reception for them tonight. And Wishing them well uh, moving <coughs> forward with uh, those postings. Um, I, I just want to overall speak to the, the enrollment, um, more so about kindergarten because you know we had to watch this closely. Uh, first of all, for anyone who happens to be watching this when it's on television and channel or channel serving, um, a reminder that are looking for our kindergarten students, those entering kindergarten the fall to be registered if, if they have not yet been registered so that we can accurately uh, forecast where it would be. Um, as I've said 
the last few meetings, we have more students enrolled at Pine Grove than at Glory Brook currently. Um, we are looking at the 1920 registrations, and you know sometimes they change by the minute, but in the last official count, I have 128 on the list uh, registered at Pine Grove, and that's compared to 110 who are, who are there this year. So you can see where we are with the entire additional section at Pine Grove. Um, so we are working uh, with the school and with the registrations at this point. Sorting out um, the possibility of whether or not we were going to need to divert some registration moving forward at some point to Warren Book instead of Pine Grove. Uh, there's a lot involved in that. As you know, we don't want to impact siblings of students. For example, this is not uh, meant to be a, a whole district plan, a redistricting plan, so to speak. That's not what we're looking at at this point, but we have had to keep a close eye on those numbers and also. Uh, Add in just looking at the board book numbers again today, and we know they need additional section of kindergarten. So we are just to be on the cautious side too, just to put this out there. We are looking into at least the possibility of a temporary trailer at Pine Grove if it became necessary. Um, that's quite costly. It's something we'd rather not have to do. But the fact of the matter is, as I've said before, we are out of usable space at Pine Grove for kindergarten in particular because the zoning requirements are different for kindergarten also. They have to have different methods of egress. Basically, they have to be on the first floor. So if you're limited, there's only a certain number of viable classrooms on the first floor in any building and here on the max at Pine Grove right now. So just know that if something different needs to happen on wide scale, certainly we having a conversation, but I think at this point we are just looking at some internal moves, the possibility if unfortunately you know, we find ourselves with 50 more students registered in the summer in Pine Grove and having a totally different conversation. But we are hopeful that by doing the registration as early as we did, um, that these numbers reflect close to uh, what they will be. Uh, the only other way currently that, that we can attempt to forecast kindergarten registrations um, in part is by checking with the town clerk and the number of births uh, five years ago that would be coming to kindergarten this age. That's one thing to look at, but it certainly doesn't really predict because I, you know, things happen in the meantime. I was born here, maybe I would still live here. Other people moved in that were not born here, so that's not a great way to forecast. Um, but we are looking at it, and as of right now, we have a plan for the numbers that we have. Every day, we look out to Shirley and say, Is anyone else come? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. So, just pointing that out. Other than that, as I have said in the past, our enrollment is where we expected it to study at this point, which I would expect it's the end of the school year. Um, strategic plan update, just very quickly, as the board knows, um, we're going through uh, what is called the capacity and coherence review. Um, alongside of the uh, Lead Connecticut and Center for School Change, who has been working alongside of us with professional development and strategic planning for about the past year. So we're in the middle of that now. Um, and I believe they will finish on the 23rd. They correct us on the And um, then they will give us some reporting back about, about their findings. And we can talk about direction for the future and setting our goals as we move forward for next year's strategic plan. So we're looking or we will find a date somewhere in the near future. Um, I want to point out a couple of things that are on the agenda. Um, first of all, as, as you heard, as um, McGraw say, the math competition field trip for May 31st to June 2nd is on the consent calendar. Um, that was a tight turnaround for the paperwork, and I appreciate the high school getting everything to us. Obviously, we don't always know if they're going to make it um, in the team, but clearly this math team did. And, Excited to be able to send them forward, so obviously looking for uh, approval tonight for sure. On that trip, there are two other trips that are on the consent calendar that are for next school year because they are out of the country, which you've seen. And also on the new business, we do have 
Ms. Dreyer here with us if um, there's some information on the health and food certification that you know we're required to do every year, so call her up if need be. And I'd like to point out um, two of the policies that they say first read on the agenda because that's the way we put them on the agenda because the board as a whole had not seen them until this packet came forward. The policy committee, however, uh, worked quite a bit on these um, two policies to make sure that they were ready to come to the board in anticipation of being able to start the school year with these policies approved and to be approved, frankly, before the summer when we're putting out notifications and handbooks and so on. We would like our board policies and district procedures to be up to date so that we're not starting the year trying to backfill policies. So we brought them tonight. It says first read, um, and we are requesting uh, as a policy committee and, and I as the superintendent that the board, if possible, uh, approve them this evening. We can talk about them when we get there, questions and so forth. But just to be clear, we did think we would be able to move that forward. So the consent calendar. Are there any questions about consent calendar? Or do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Okay. Just Second. Second by David. Am I right? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous. Okay, new business. Healthy food certification for 2019-2020. Maggie, would you like to come forward? This is the healthy food certification that every year um, we vote on. So it's a two-part uh, vote. The first one is to agree to comply with the Connecticut strict regulations, nutritional regulations, which in turn then we receive 10 cents per month for that. The second piece of it is to make exempt food being sold at events. So if you have a basketball game as opposed to a basketball practice, you do not have to follow the nutritional regulations. So two votes is one to comply and then one to agree to the exemptions. Thank you. Uh, yes, and that's new, isn't it? That we can actually exempt or has that always been happening? No, that's always the case. The only thing that's new was new last year. We no longer have to sign the forms. Once this is in the minutes, I'll submit the minutes electronically to the state. All right, thank you. So we need a motion to approve. What's the wording we should use? Um, the nutritional. It's two votes here. Right, right, so the first one would be, I don't know when we get to that page, but I can crash or something. Do you have it in front of you? So a motion to approve the healthy food option uh, required by section 10-215F. Should I say anything more on the record for that? No, I think that's that's sufficient, right? We are approving the healthy food option if we approve that. Yes. Right. And I have a motion on that. So okay, Jackie moves. Do I have a second? Second. Second by David. Any conversation? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions passes unanimously. The second motion would be um, to in, um, to approve the use of exemptions for I mean, special occasions on school grounds under that's required by the Connecticut General Statute Section 10 25 F. No, I think it, it's just, as you said, the motion to allow for food exemptions um, than the, the healthy food policy, right, Maggie? Okay, so um, the motion is to allow food exemptions uh, to include the specific criteria required by, by the Connecticut General Statute. Okay, thank you. I have a motion. Connecticut General Statute 215F. And we review this annually, it says, correct? Yes, I will have to. Okay, can I have a motion? So moved. Okay, David moves, do I have a second? Okay. Okay. By Jackie, exactly. any questions or Good. comments? Okay, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Maggie. Thank Thank you. If you want to excuse yourself here, that's perfectly fine. Thank you for coming.
All right, the next one would be policy 5132, student dress. This is one of the ones that we'd like to act on this evening. Yes. And with Laura not here, do you want to speak to it or do you? I have more than had it. Okay. If you don't mind. I don't mind. Um, <laughs> so we had, the, the short of this is that um, depending on versions of the handbook that you looked at at, at different schools and um, what was actually in practice, we, we didn't have a standardized uh, dress policy in the district, and number one. And number two, uh, we had a number of concerns as a district and also from our parents and our students and members of the board that it was a policy that needed to be looked at again in the lens of 2019. So um, we agreed. Uh, we started with the dress code policies that we could round up that were in district. Um, took with the bills, had a number of conversations. Um, particularly, this is this is an issue that particularly comes home at the middle school and the high school, you know, more than any than any other school. But this is regardless a policy uh, for the entire district, which also means that it needs to be broad enough that it covers what we need to cover as an entire district, because that's how we are able to effectively implement it and adhere to it. So. We looked at what we had in place already. We looked around the country at some of uh, the exemplars, and I'll just say here that there has been a lot of talk around the entire country around student dress, in particular related to um, female uh, dress and body shaming, and there was pieces of conversation uh, alongside the Me Too movement, for example. So this has been a, a hotly contested area, I would say, throughout the country. Uh, and we did look at a number of other dress codes. We also then went back to our, our board attorney, Shivan Goodman, uh, what he's called the model policy, and started again from there. So what I would say is that what we worked hard in doing as both the administration and then as a committee is to make this policy that was unisex, number one, so that we didn't speak directly to items of clothing that very often are worn more by girls, frankly, than they are by boys, and uh, that was inherent in some of the policy. So I'll, I'll give an example that was there that we talked about quite a bit on the policy committee. Um, one piece of the previous policy was uh, revealing of, the, of um, under undergarments, undershirts, uh, under undergarments. And so we had an entire conversation on the fact that um, Mr. Macy, let me see. Yeah. You, have, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have, you have, you have, you can't see it. I was okay. going to use you as an ex impossible example. Somebody of the, so men very often, right, will wear a, an undershirt underneath yeah. a polo shirt or an open, an open dress shirt, for example. Okay, there's a there. And so we had a conversation about the fact that we're talking about an undergarment that's considered an undergarment for a, a young man. But for a, a young woman, an undergarment might not be an undershirt. It might be a, a camisole, for example. And so we took that language out because we wanted, again, it to be able to be applied to both um, sexes. So the big picture here is that um, we are looking at safety more than anything else in the dress code and ensuring that um, we have a positive school climate, so of course we would not allow attire or accessories depicting or suggesting violence, you know, for example, or what is the constitutional um, interpretation of quote fighting words. So you see that we had a lot of conversation around what this looked like in practice, and certainly a lot of case law about what this looks like in practice, and I think where we landed was um, specific enough that we needed it to be for enforcement. And then building administrators agreed, but yet broad enough for us to have the discretion that sometimes is necessary. Because as you know, you cannot write a policy that addresses every single possibility. And another piece of the conversation we had, a dress code in 2019, some of even the terms that we use look very different even than they did 20 years ago. Right? So if you, uh, if you talk to a, a young person about trousers, for example, most of them don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> Not a word that you used anymore. Number one, and number two, um, what's acceptable 
changes over time, for better or for worse. That's not, <laughs> not, the, not the conversation <laughs> for, for us to have, I guess, but that's part of the big picture discussion that we have. This is the first read? No. So this is one we are asking that, if it's possible, be approved tonight so that we can include it to start the school year uh, with all of our notifications that go out. So I want to be clear, um, because I spoke about the undergarments. Notice this says shorts, skirts, or pants, which reveal undergarments, right? That's, that's different. The original wording was clothing that reveals undergarments. And we changed it to leave it because we are pretty clear we didn't necessarily, we couldn't think of any time that we might think it was a good idea for the undergarments that were under shorts, skirts, or pants to be revealed. <laughs> but when we're talking about shirts, that was the example that I used. Any other questions by board members about this policy? I'd be curious to hear if the mayor has any input. Um, so if they're like, so my question would be for that would be kind of like, so what would be the, what's that group? It's kind of requiring a collect for short sort of things like that. Like, because I mean, I've seen people wear, like for example, comparing the girls to the boys, you don't see, like the boy wearing the short short would not be considered anything wrong if the girls wear the short short considered showing too much. So what does that look like for a student where you say, well, you're breaking the dress code, but what does that look like? That so, Amir, you might not have seen all of this until tonight, yeah. but you notice that's not here for exactly the reason right. that you just described, because that's one of the pieces that school districts have been moving away from, how to determine what, a, what an appropriate length is for boys versus girls. And you know, over the years, there's been a number of way, you know, ways that people have attempted to do that. You know, with rulers of the niches, with, with where people's fingertips fall, which you know, is one that we always say, all that matters is whether or not you have long arms. And, and that would, would, second, I have that conversation. Would, would some of that, they'll be addressed by the entire thing? Yes. People vulgar or offensive. Right. So to be clear, this is what he's, thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Fleshman, where I was headed next. This is broad enough that there is discretion, which the building administrators do need discretion. And, and again, styles are going to change, and exactly what things are called are going to change. And so when we talk about attire accessories that are overly offensive or, or disruptive to the educational process, there might be a time that someone has to make a determination that, you know, just for example, if, if oh, I think one of the examples we use is if you came to the school only in a bikini bottom, that would probably not fit the spirit of something that was But along those disruptive. lines, how does this relate to the athletic, um, uh, athletic wear? It doesn't. It this doesn't. is student so dress is during the school day. Okay. So to your point about the uniforms, that might be more of an idea. I think the policy committee has done a really great job and I'd like to make a motion to approve the new board policy 5132. Second by Jason. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Extensions? Yes. Thank you. That'll be very much appreciated by our schools for being able to be proactive. The next one, uh, mastery examinations, the other that we were asking for action on this evening. Um, and I, Dr. Rusak, would you like to speak to that? Or? Okay. The mastery examinations really is just to bring the policy up to date. Uh, our students are no longer tested in 10th grade because we moved to 11th grade. We do not um, administer the CMT or CAT any longer. We've moved to Smarter Balance. Uh, Connecticut SAT school day. So it really is just reflecting the current assessments that we administer and reflecting also what that means for our special populations such as students with um, special education needs and our English learners. I do have a quick question if I can. Um, you mentioned earlier the NGSS. I know this is the first year of the testing. Is that required and is that in this policy or is it something we have to come back at a later date? 
it is required and it is okay. in the policy for grades 5, 8, and 11 for science. I thought I wasn't sure. <laughs> Thank you. So to be clear, um, we stayed away from naming the assessments in case they change. Thank you, I see it. Yep. Right? Because yep. they are, that's why we're just referring to them as the required assessments because as you know, they have changed several times in the past 10 years. I was looking for the name. Thank Got you. Be, yep. Thank so it's you, not I appreciate there. it. It looks like you guys have done the policy for you. have done a lot of work on this, and I'd like to hear the motion to pass uh, the new policy 6146.2A. Second. Jason seconds. We have a team over there. Do we have any questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Questions? Passes unanimously. Sex discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace. So there are two, right? There, are, there, there's staff and students. So I'll just start by saying that one of the pieces that's important here to, to why there is a revision is because we had one policy that uh, group staff and students together spoke to both groups within the same policy uh, because of. Uh, both changes in legislation and also changes in the way we should handle those kind of matters from a procedural standpoint. Um, knew it was important to separate out those two policies because as you might imagine, sexual harassment claims can look very different between um, employees than they do from, from students, um, students to student, for example. Um, and so we worked very hard as a policy committee to be one at least twice and then been a few last minute revisions before it came here tonight. Again, um, we took our existing policy, uh, compared it to current legislation, um, and also there's, there's this, another piece when you're talking about discrimination and harassment. Parts of it refer to Connecticut General Statute, parts of it refer to policies and procedures that are in place at agencies such as the Office of Civil Rights. So. They, they get melded together in, into a policy that's recommended um, for all employers, but specific to school districts, especially the students, um, by legal counsel. So again, we started with our own policy, um, com combined and redlined where we could with the current model policy, and then continued to have some discussions to make sure that it was as clear as what we brought to you this evening. So this one is, is pretty dense. I think it, it uh, certainly deserves a, a full first read. This is another one that obviously, in an ideal world, uh, we have these kind of procedures in place in the right way before the school year starts. But we can, this is one that these two, we can live with being held back until the next board meeting and we look forward to them because a lot of these relate to internal controls and procedures regarding complaints. They're less, they're more about that and the education of students and staff around them than they are about being in a student handbook, for example. So do board members have any questions about this since it is an actual first read? Any comments or thoughts? Are there any particular areas that you'd like us to look at once we move from the rest of the board? Um, I, I mean, I think if you want to know the biggest area of conversation we have the policy committee meetings, I think the needed paragraph for the policy committee we had a lot of discussion about the introduction. The introductory paragraph of the policy committee, making sure that they accurately reflect what the policy was trying to accomplish. So that a person looking at this kind of stuff in the policy can go in the first paragraph and say, oh, here's an old supplies or it doesn't. Right, and I think there was a lot of hard work and a lot of discussion. I think what, we're, what we have here in those two introductory paragraphs does a good job of spelling out the policy. So that was really what we talked about. When you talk about the two introductory, are you talking about the definitions we're using of discrimination and harassment? No, even before that. That, 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 that I just want that clarification. Yes. Um, so like the literal first paragraph. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I apologize because I meant to ask Mr. Medic, uh, or as the Resources director who worked very closely 
uh, with us on these policies if there's anything you wanted to add or clarify that you spoke about. Uh, I think we're going to be taking a look at the introductory paragraphs on the side of our district. But also, if you want to raise it yourself, we'll get this in the complaint procedure. So, we'll get this mask in the complaint procedure. I don't know if it's on here. We're really taking a look at the complaint procedure and familiarizing yourself with that as a complaint procedure looks much different for an employee as it would for a student or a parent or guardian who makes a complaint on behalf of a student. But both of those, both of those procedures are uh, tied closely to recommendations from the Office of Civil Rights and Rights of Legislation. So uh, much of the work, much of the discussion is about to lead in and uh, any feedback and any questions are also crucial. My question is always how far away is this from legal counsel's recommendation. Yeah, how much of it has been evenized? So I, I, I think I can speak to that because this was um, an example of where we had healthy discussion around it, but as I think you're asking for the same, as someone who also works in school for the same reason that I'm about to say, um, I, I for one was adamant that this stayed as close to the, the model policy as possible because it is so, um, heavily governed by law and the definitions that are present in the law. Um, so in some regards, we looked at it and said, okay, so what's the difference between discrimination versus harassment and so on, and what are subsets of which pieces, and you'll see that in the policy. But the reality is that that is how we are advised to refer to them because it is how they are defined, both under the law and or precedents that have been set already based on um, cases that have been brought forward. Is there mandatory training for personnel related to this policy? Yes. Okay. And that's currently being implemented? Yes. So we have, one of the things that we have to have, and I think we've um, done a great job of expanding over the course of the this year, people in the public policy board is the type of Title IX training um, at the building levels. We have many more people trained in that. Um, and as we're moving forward, to answer your question, there's some amount of it this year, but knowing the policy needed to be changed, there will be more targeted training when we start our next school year, which is another reason we're looking forward to making sure the policy goes through the board so that we're ready to do the required trainings at the beginning of the school year. Any other questions or comments from board members? Well, considering that for both the sexual harassment in the workplace as well as um, sex discrimination and sexual harassment of students. We're good with that, so we'll leave those as a first read. Next is use of facilities funds, which enables with lower refinishing schedule. Ms. Michelle, can you speak to that? Or I Um, the Finance Committee was kind enough to allow administration's recommendation to bring forth a gymnasium refinishing schedule. Um, we began last year with the new gym here at the high school. It was completed over the summer. You have had a chance to take a look. It is full um, refinishing, meaning sanding all the way down um, to the bare wood, full paint, and then of course refinishing the necessary products over that and now the maintenance. We had requested to use the same type of approval process, accessing um, the current facilities use fund uh, to continue that process along because the gym floors are the most widely used piece of our facilities and they are even more expanded now. We saw more use over this winter in um, our elementary schools. So we did create um, a refinishing schedule as we said we would last year and we are asking to look at possibly expending an estimated $34,000 out of the use of facilities fund to refinish TBS and RBS this summer. How much is in the fund? There's just over $100,000 at this point. Um, we do have some funds um, already encumbered. If you recall, in the fall, we split between the general fund and the use of facilities fund, the uh, multi-purpose field. So, 
we do also use it for um, Veterans Day transportation and then the staff related to any use ongoing. So the only other thing that occurred to me when I read this time, I'm folding paper for the picture project, but uh, I think the school board of consequences <coughs> motion to approve I'll make the motion to approve an expenditure from the use of facilities enterprise account for the purposes of refinishing the TBS and RBS gymnasium floors totaling an estimated thirty four thousand two hundred thirty dollars. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Bogdan, is that right? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions passes unanimously. Supplemental 
appropriation, if you will, of our funds to add on to privately raised funds for projects in the district. For example, a playground in the past at Lord of High School, as an example. So we had that conversation as a possibility for how we could move this forward with our, our year-end funds uh, to have something pledged, if you will, to be held as, uh, aside uh, to give to the turf and field lighting project and aid more to help. So that's it. Um, more specifics for the finances that have been shot. So what are we voting on tonight? We're voting on an amount tonight? $30,000 is the amount that we're comfortable taking from the sales use fund at this point without bringing it down to low level. But one of our discussions was this isn't limiting us to looking at the ability to contribute more in the future. We just, you know, are aware of it this time in our budget, not able to, you know, access any other money. That's, so this is where we're starting with, and we'd like to at least make that pledge soon. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure so I, I think that just referring to the seventy thousand dollars that it cost to put the stanchions in, which is part of the project. Correct. We expanded the project. I understand that, but it's part of the project cost. I don't. I don't believe that it is. I could be. Right. You're that's, that's my understanding. I could be wrong, but I, I don't like, I think to say that the town is pledged seven thousand yeah, dollars. That money is not. It's not completely accurate, accurate to say it's a pledge. And I just not to split hairs, but I'm not sure that's an accurate representation of the seventy thousand. The seventy thousand is an is a project issue to turn the field project, so it's clear to everybody. Yes. That's put it you correct. It was part, that piece was a part of the project that was added in um, to ensure that this could move forward more easily. And I'm in favor of the lights and trying to move the cans and help the lights along. I'm also in favor of seeing how this project progresses and what the budget looks like because if the project is tracked in the budget and there's enough money to fund the lights under the amount that's approved by referendum, Technically, the building can make that recommendation to the town council. Whether the town council would approve it, I don't know. But if there was money left in the budget, that is something that could happen in the project progresses. So I think that we should at least be aware of that. So, well, I, I, have quite, I didn't quite understand how that works. So, could bonding be used for the lighting the way the referendum was awarded and they could so include it? My understanding is because the lights are intricately tied to the project in the, in the, in the vote that was approved by the referendum. As long as it doesn't exceed the dollar amount that was approved by the referendum, which was 2.9 million and change. So it, the answer, I believe to that question, all the meetings I've been to and all of us have kind of done, the answer is yes, it could fall into that bond if there was sufficient funds to pay for it. So looking at the numbers, continue, uh, considering the contingency amount, is any material used? It looks like I think there should be money left. I don't, you know, who knows, right? Okay. But I mean, we're early on in the project that I think as of our last building committee meeting, the first payment had even been made in the general contractor yet. So it's hard to say for sure what the money is going to go like. But as of here, as of the last meeting, knock on wood, things are going well and there's no hiccups. You would expect the track on budget. I just speaking personally, my personal I would personally be in favor of trying to get those lights added as part of the project. So if we were pledged to 30,000 today, I've never done this before, so I don't know how this works with the fundraising. Say we pledged the 30,000 today to get the fundraising started, and then this other scenario works its way through. We have not then spent anything at 30,000 to put back to. So to be clear, we're not really putting out the money. Right, now, so I, mean, I, I would not change, given that information, I would change the motion, motion to be contingent on it not being bonded as part of the project. That would be. But I want to be able to help Acorn if it doesn't yeah, happen. I think that makes sense. I mean, a lot of things have to go right for it to fall into the project, but I don't think it's outside of the realm of at least possibility. Well, that would protect everybody's input well, and you yep. add that as the number of Well, I think we have to be clear, too, that 
if we have this discussion in the finance committee, that it's also contingent upon the project moving forward at all. So, you know, to your point, we're not we're not going back to the office and writing a check to Acorn for thirty thousand dollars tomorrow. This was to agree ahead of time. This is an enterprise account, and money does roll forward. But to agree ahead of time so that they had a commitment, basically, so that Acorn had a commitment from us that if everything lined up with their fundraising, we were committing to giving X amount of dollars as part of the project. So that's one, that's one contingency that the project has to move forward for us to commit to actually pay the money. And two, I think, you know, to your point, it should also be contingent on someone else yeah. and you know, on the instance, town side if it's bonded in. If they needed the last $30,000 I mean, I think that makes sense. The money being needed above and beyond the plan. Well, it should be secondary to Acorn, so you don't have to worry So I have some concerns. So looking at the history of this project, the project it was always the original pitch, and this has been a point of discussion amongst us, three letters. State, town, private. State bail. We have agreed to town money through referendum. By us giving them $30,000, we are adding more town money. That's really what it is. I do not feel we should be adding more town money at this point. That's my opinion. 2.9 town money has already been spent on the project, committed to the project. Can I, can I just ask a question? Sure. Just like you said, uh, would be by at this point, meaning? Sure. The, the scope of the project is 2.9 million. We get a feel with the stanchions. My tr personal expectation is there is a separate step that steps up. I would rather Acorn come to us and go, we are $30,000 short. Then we can have that conversation. I'm not so confident yet. and, and conversation earlier this evening is that they're having problems raising funds there is other money that this money could be used for other projects in in the school district I don't want to see us pledge money without seeing that a it's needed and B that we're gonna be at least matched if not received. so to respond to that at the committee we did have that discussion because my recollection of both the Pine Grove and Rockbrook playgrounds, mm -hmm. when the Board of Ed did provide funding, it was to put it over the top. It mm -hmm. can be a certain amount. The reason that we're trying to uh, propose it tonight is because we heard from a point that they're um, looking at a number larger than expected, mm -hmm. and to be able to go to their fundraising goals saying we have this committed would help them move forward, and I feel comfortable. I would like to hear Acorn say, this is what we have committed. I'm now asking for additional funds from the county. So you want to do it the opposite, I right? I, I think $2.9 million was already higher. The, the amount was raised to address the infill issue. It was already higher than what I was comfortable going with to begin with. I'm not here to re skew that argument. I, at the end, I scored the 2.9. But this is even more money. And the presentation earlier was, she was hoping for three times the amount of money. So at what point do we say no more town money? I think that there's a lot of money spent on this one turf field. There are other fields, there are other facilities in this district that would also need the attention. You brought some up earlier. I think we have sort of an obligation to, to keep in mind this money, how this money else could be used. That's my thought. What's the timing of
pledge and I'll not have the contingency if it's not funded by the other So, and I think, what Susan spoke to me about and then and then at the finance committee meeting about was that the feeling of acorn is that if, if it appears that there's support right on both sides on the town side because they did move forward and, and put that money for stanchions in and on the school district side because we agree to commit money if it if it gets no that offense, point. we are the town side. Yeah, I, I, and, and that, and I oh, that's, a, that's a real point. And, and it's been a point of contention also amongst the, the nine of us. We are the town. That 2.9 represents our money as well. I disagree. I'm just making the recapping kind of what happened in, in the previous meeting so that we're all on the same page about what, why we were asked and, and what we were asked to do uh, to, to maybe assist in jump starting the fundraising again not by actually parting with the money but by committing to the project so to speak that's what was asked of us jeff i have a question mm -hmm. um, is there a material difference that comes from changing the order of the commitments of the funds since at the end of the day we're either putting up lights over or not the funding was either the, the funding for the lights is uh, requires a lot more money than was approved in, in the bonds for the, the turf field. Mm -hmm. So if you change the order of the commitments, meaning that, that our 30,000 is moved out to the end of this, so that if they were in 30,000, that we would commit them. Does it really matter? It does, because my hope is that they wouldn't need it. Oh, I'm so still- a chance that they wouldn't need I am it. still, we, I, I went into this project okay. with the hope that there was still going to be the discussion about private fundraising. Fund okay. The town decided to add the stanchions, which I agree makes complete sense in the long run. I am also, I have seen communities, not as well off as this one, do this exact feat. But when I teach it, I feel we have committed more than enough money to this project at this moment. And we have to look at the bigger picture, right? We've talked about the questions and uncertainty of what our financial future is. And I'm not going to point issues. I'm not looking to make that an argument. But there's a lot of uncertainty. There are fields and other facility parts that needs to be upkept. There's a discussion of the possibility of a uh, temporary classroom, right? We've had discussions before about some of the other fields. I just think we've contributed enough money to this. I would like to see the private fundraising step up there. End. I think the taxpayer stepped up enough. And I guess my concern is they're kind of asking for this from us at this point so that they can, when they go out into the community and start their fundraising, they can say, look, we have a commitment from the town. And $70,000 $70, for the and, the and the board of ed that, that this is a project that really matters. I don't separate the two of them. They've got the $70,000 that's been well, added. Well, it's two different sets of decision makers, to be honest. I'm not on the town council, okay. so I didn't make that decision. Okay. I have great respect for people who did it, but this is our board, this is our decision. It's still and all taxpayers. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I pay taxes too, so that's my money. A lot of it. It's all the... Okay. <laughs> I pay double this year. Um, so I I understand your concern, and I really agree with that, and I, I, I also like to make sure that we, you know, I believe in the nickel and of public funds, mm -hmm. because I think it's, that should be OP taxpayers and the people who put their trust in us. But I guess I am concerned about, you know, the idea that we could be having this field and possibly not having this very important element of the field to really use it. Um, so it doesn't, it feels like to me we have the money in this fund, right? This isn't, um, this isn't where the student meets the classroom kind of money. This is a facilities use fund. This is money we were paid to use our facilities. Right. So, so that changes things for me a little bit. Um, I agree with scoreboards. Maybe we need a checklist of, of priorities. This to me seems like it might be something that we could kind of move to the top of that list. In my mind, the plan does not include lights, but allows for the possibility of lights to be added in addition. So in my mind, this track, this field was not going to have lights. If lights, if money was raised for the lights, cherry on top. That, that's honestly how I've looked at this project. 
I will be clear to the council that on the town council meeting, we have no debate. I am not optimistic that the lights are going to be part of the final project. It's paid for by this project. But I, what I'm trying to convey is that I am of the opinion as a citizen of AVA, a member of this board, a member of that committee, if there's money available as the project progresses, my approach would be to get those lights added to the project. But it's a, pos it's a possibility. I'd like, I mean, I was considering doing it tonight, but here in discussion, I could wait to June. I want, I want to make, wait past June. You know, I will be making a motion on, in June. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, given what we're talking about, you know, to, to your point, tabling it, we don't want to be divided, I don't think, on, on this, because I think we're all of the mindset that we're grateful that the turf project moved forward, right, and be able to and support it in any way that we can. I think it, it both sides of the aisle would say that. Um, I also think that it, I, I look at it a little bit as a six of one, half dozen of the other about when the money, because we're not, again, and I, I agree, let's table it, but just to, to finish the conversation about you know when do we give the money, I don't see any issue with, let's say we come back in June and we decide that we'll commit the money they were committing the money when they're when they've raised all the funds. That's really what we're saying, no matter what. So it is. It would be, you know, the quote last thirty thousand dollars, really, no matter what, because that was the contingency we spoke about was that they had to raise the funds. We're not going to. We're not issuing a check for thirty thousand dollars and then they're fifty thousand dollars shy of doing the lights. That that wasn't what we talked about or what we said we agreed to. So for all intents and purposes, to the point we made here tonight, it is the final. Thirty thousand dollars. It's just when we say that we will commit to, to the idea of it. Yeah, maybe right. uh, maybe part of this is this something the contribution to be about to pay back some of the forty thousand dollars, which would be the last possibility. I think Jeff's point is there's a possibility all the funds could be raised through fundraising. Right. Uh, um, so maybe we just change the in that fashion. Willing to contribute up to 
knowledge, but our preference would be to help us wonder the terms that we are preferencing. Yes, we have a lot of time behind Would that impact, would that change? I'm not ready to vote on this. So the, the reasons that I would table it is because I feel like some information I'm not completely aware of, to Jason's point, whether the money can be bonded for the lighting. I'd like clarification on that. Um, I don't think we necessarily need a list from the administration because this was put forward to the committee by the administration, knowing that there are other needs within the district and this became a priority at this point. So you know, we've been evaluating over the years in our finance committee what to spend facilities use money on and this came to the top of the list right now. So I don't think that's going to change, but understanding the bonding issue to me is important. And while I'll table until June. Yeah, I don't know the best answer to get that is probably. I, I, I sat through a town council meeting where there was a long discussion about this. I left with that discussion that there's something that could happen with my bank of value tonight. It's probably not a likelihood that something's going to happen. So that's my understanding. I do think it was mentioned in the town meeting. Right, there, there was a whole, we would need to check with town manager, but there was a whole discussion about how to word the bonding resolution to cover additional. Because I think there was even a discussion maybe we can include the stands or those things and create the, the broad enough that we cover. But I, I think we do need confirmation. And the town council, after the referendum passed, had a meeting, I think it was in January, and the bond council was there, and there was a long discussion about this. Again, I think the long structure was, you know, as long as something is related to the project that is approved and there's money for it, it can be part of the bond. In my understanding. I know the information. I know we have hours and hours and hours to do this. I may have missed this, but I don't recall what the dialogue. I think the way this was presented to us is, you know, coming from Acorn, and there's an opportunity to get some things considered, not for a list of priorities, and we think this rises to the top. I don't recall that dialogue. I think you know. Here's thirty thousand dollars that we have in funds. What may we spend it on? Is it the extra rooms that we may need for the gardeners? Is it scoreboards? So, any motion for it? No, you just don't have to have it. Oh, okay. So let's table it. Right. Communication from Avon board members. Okay. I have one small item. Uh, this past weekend, I went camping with my son's Boy Scout troop. One of the things the Boy Scouts have to do to earn a merit badge for citizenship is they have to interview an elected official. So I was the elected official. And so uh, while dinner was cooking at the campsite, uh, I had six uh, students um, interviewing me, asking me various questions about how the board works, what we do, and so forth. But they had a lot of uh, questions about school security, and that was really the gist of the discussion. And uh, you know, when I didn't reveal any more information that was available to the general public about how security works and the plans and so forth. Uh, but I tried to instill a sense of confidence in them that a lot of the security measures that they see are all geared around buying extra time for police responders to arrive in the event of a shooter incident. Nothing's going to solve, solve the problem completely, but we, we're just basically trying to run out the clock on that, guys. Um, well, anyway, one of the issues that was brought up, and I offered to bring it to the board, is that uh, the students felt that in certain cases, these were mostly middle school students, they felt as if they had problems getting other students to take the code reds seriously, and that they were joking and making noise and just not being very serious about the process. Um, and that was a, a significant concern to them. Uh, and so I don't know what we do here to, to deal with the issue. But I thought I'd bring it up because it was interesting to hear what they had to say. And it was interesting to hear their observations. Uh, we're not going to hear this anywhere else, so I thought I'd bring it up. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to, to just uh, take a different perspective on hearing the service um, to our board of ed. I, I really appreciate your leadership style. Um, I think it brings forth compassion and thoughtfulness. Um, and I really appreciate the wisdom that you bring. I mean, it seems in our day and age, 
it's hard to find a balanced view amongst different topics. Um, we see a lot of divisions in our culture, uh, a lot of issues that create splits amongst us, but I think from the issues that we've discussed, we've always try to find a balanced view, which I think is tremendous for our future leaders. And I look forward to, to seeing great things from you. Anyone else? Okay, we move to communication from the public. If anyone remaining would like to say anything. Can I talk again? Sure. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for the thoughtful discussion on that proposal. I just want to answer a few questions and just offer some clarity on some issues. Jason, if you could research the possibility of some of that contingency money being applied to the life, that would be fantastic. Our, Although we did not ask that question directly in our first meeting with Brandon, it seemed very clear to us that we had no option to get any of the overage money. That would be a game changer for us. Um, Jeffrey, to your points, uh, we have not begun fundraising. We are launching our campaign June 1st. One of the things that makes the grant applications, which we're hoping will be a considerable part of our fundraising, attractive is when you can prove that you've got some large donations and showing even though the town did not give us seventy thousand dollars it was in kind it was a donation um, so the idea twofold for asking the money up front and just for the record the money not only for the playground but for the last lighting project that Avon undertook for the light for the uh, middle school tennis courts was original C money it was not money that brought them over the edge or over the top um, but the, co the, um, the motive behind it is Yes, to make our applications more attractive to some of the larger foundations that do fund projects like this, but also just as an optical thing for PR to go to the public and say, look, we know this is a lot of money, but you know the town side of the budget has contributed $70,000, and our vision was that the school side of the budget would also contribute $70,000, which would give us get us closer to the $200,000 that we thought we were embarking on. Now, do you teach in Canton? I teach in Bristol. In Bristol, I don't know about Bristol, but Canton was one of the, the um, one of the avatars that we used because we were not at, we didn't have access to the original information on funding. Um, but just for an example, that's a community that's less affluent than Avon. It's also probably not even two thirds of the size of Avon. Their project, which looked the same, was two hundred thousand dollars. So literally half of what we have to fundraise. It took them nearly three years to raise two hundred thousand dollars. So, um, and, they, and they did have a very strong community support for this. We're not feeling that in some of our early uh, focus groups yet. So, um, twice the cost. We certainly do not want to wait three years to get these fields lit. They really don't have, they're not even at near capacity if they can't be lit. Um, we, let's see, uh, hang on a second. The money that we have asked for is surplus money, so I think we would feel differently if we were coming to the board saying, don't pay your teachers or don't fund you know, learning materials purchases. This is money that, as far as I know, as far as we know, is money that's surplus money that I would imagine has to be spent anyway. And it would seem to me and to our board that spending on something that's happening right here in the schools that benefits our students would make sense that the school portion of the town budget would contribute separately. Um, and I think that was all of my notes. So that's all I just wanted to add some clarity. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very guys. much. Okay, so now I would like to make a motion to move into executive session with a break in between to allow Eric, our handy cameraman, to break down. We invite And we are inviting in Ms. Bashad and Roberto. Well, you're welcome to stay. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, 845. I have a motion. Okay, thank you. So, Jason will second. Vote in all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Passes.